Hi, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. You'd think that one B660 motherboard would perform much like another, wouldn't you? Well, we've got five here and we've tested them with three CPUs, an i3, an i5 and an i7, and we've achieved some really very different results from some of them. Stick with us because this video could save you some headaches and some money as we step through the B660 motherboard minefield. We've selected a handful of B660 motherboards based on brand, availability and price. We chose boards that we wanted to recommend, but couldn't do so without checking them out first. So these aren't the rock bottom boards, more the ones that you might pair with an i5 for gaming or a general purpose build. Our testing includes rigorous all core tests, including demanding multi-core workloads, as well as gaming and a synthetic benchmark test. We tested each board with the same system, 16 gigabytes of 3600 MHz RAM at XMP, an 860 watt platinum power supply, and the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 240 mm all-in-one cooler to ensure that the CPUs didn't thermally throttle. The GPU was an RTX 3080 throughout. We also tested each CPU in an MSI Z690 Tomahawk with unlocked power limits to set a benchmark that we knew was unhindered by power limitations. And it is power limitations and how they're applied and whether you can adjust them that really define these B660 motherboards. We wanted to see how these motherboards performed with minimal user intervention. So we set them up much as we'd expect most users would do. We built the system, applied XMP, but didn't pay any special attention to power limits unless the BIOS prompted you to do so. We then went in and ran a set of tests. Our aim was to see how the boards performed out of the box. Then if we identified any performance problems or limitations, we looked into them to see if we could address them and how easy they were to rectify. Our question was really this, how well does the motherboard perform out of the box? And if it underperforms, how easy is it for the user to get into BIOS and make it achieve full performance? I'm going to break this video down like this. First of all, I'll run through the performance with each of the CPUs in turn. That way, if you know which CPU you want to run, you can look at how all of the boards perform with that specific processor. Then at the end, I'll summarize any issues with each of the individual boards. That way, it's most easy for you guys to navigate and find the information that's relevant to you. So feel free to use the timestamps I've put in the comment below. We're using the information we've got from this testing to make a full set of recommendations across the B660 motherboard range. So please do hit like and subscribe if that's something that interests you and you'll see that content as soon as it's ready for you. Let's run through the boards on test in rough price order. We've selected boards that have the bare minimum specification we'd be willing to recommend. So they've all got four RAM slots, two M.2 slots, adequate USB ports on the rear, and the base specification that means they're, they're decent boards provided they perform okay. First up, we've got the Gigabyte B660M DS3H. This is the AX version with built-in Wi-Fi, but there's a non-Wi-Fi version available. It's got a relatively basic six-phase VRM with a dinky heatsink on one set of the VRMs only. It's got two M.2 slots, adequate rear USB ports, including USB-C, but it certainly looks built down to its price. It retails at around $120 without Wi-Fi and $140 with Wi-Fi. Then we've got the Asus Prime B660M-A Wi-Fi D4. Again, this is a pretty basic specification with a six phase VRM to the CPU, although it does have heat sinking on both VRM sections. The silver heat sinks lift the looks, and whilst it has an internal high speed USB C header for USB C on the case, there's no rear USB C port. The non Wi Fi version is $140 and lacks that upper heat sink, but is otherwise identical, and the Wi Fi version is around $160. There's at least six or possibly eight variants of the Prime B660 boards with varying specification, so please do be careful when you're shopping around. Next up, we've got the ASRock B660M Pro RS. This is a board that actually has got pretty reasonable specification comparable to the last two. There's an eight phase VRM for setup with full heat sinking, two M.2 slots, and some nice RGB flourishes on the rear of the board. It also sells at about $140. Moving into the slightly more expensive territory, we've tested the Asus Tough B660M E D4. This has a more gamer focused branding and uses the 10 phase power design with partial heat sinking. It's available from around $150 for this version to $180 for the B660M Plus Wi-Fi. Do just be cautious when shopping around as again Asus have released at least 8 versions of the tough B660 motherboard this generation so be sure of what you're getting. And finally the most expensive board in the test in some markets is the MSI Pro B660M-A DDR4. This board is nearly identical to the MSI B660 Bazooka aside from some rear I.O. quirks and the gamer styling of the Bazooka. This board has one of the strongest VRMs in test with 8 phases and robust heat sinking. This version has a pretty wild collection of 4 display outputs on the rear but other than that it's unremarkable with the same set of 2 M.2 slots, rear USB and general features and specifications as the other board. 
It's currently around $140 in the US, which seems pretty reasonable, but it's 160 euros in Europe right now. This MSI board rounds out our affordable B660 lineup. Let's look at some tests starting with the i3. We're running these tests using the i3-12100F CPU, which is a really high performance little CPU, four cores and eight threads, and it's fantastic for gaming and general use, thanks to its very high individual core speed. First, we ran Cinebench R23 as a single run to establish if the motherboards were capable of running this budget powerhouse well. You can see these results are very close and match the performance of the control board, the MSI Z690 Tomahawk. The variance is basically margin of error, with the exception of the ASRock Pro RS, which initially scored 200 points lower. This was enough to highlight it to us, so a bit of digging and setting base frequency boost to 140 watts in BIOS lifted available power and saw performance improve to the middle of the pack. But there's more about this later. Single core performance is nearly identical on all boards, indicating that they're boosting correctly as power limits don't impact that single core test. This single core result is an important indicator of gaming performance. Looking at the plot of power draw and core frequency throughout the multi-core run, you can see the ASRock delivering slightly less power to the CPU than other boards, explaining that low score before the power limits are lifted manually. Next we tried Blender, which took an incredibly long time to run on this 4-core CPU, it's certainly not ideal for it, but the aim here was to look for any long-term quirks in behaviour, for example a low power limit kicking in after a minute or several minutes, and limiting the performance of the CPU. As you can see, they all ran pretty much within margin of error, with the Gigabyte coming last, but only by a small amount. There don't look to be any hugely different power profiles being applied over time, and all of the boards run this CPU to its potential in this test. Next up it's 3 Mark Time Spy, and we've isolated out the CPU performance metric here to just look at how that is impacted by these motherboards. Again, while the Gigabyte is at the bottom of the chart, it's not by a huge margin. The rest of the boards perform very much within margin of error. 200 points isn't a huge amount, but it is interesting here that the Gigabyte is underperforming by a noticeable amount. Let's move on to some game testing, which is where this CPU really shines. We want to make sure that even these budget boards can get full performance out of it. Shadow of the Tomb Raider looks pretty much in order, although again we do see the Gigabyte at the bottom of the chart, giving away 10 frames per second to everything else. And looking at Rainbow Six Siege, there's no prizes by now for guessing which board comes bottom of the chart, but again it's not by much, about 10% or 30 frames per second. The Gigabyte DS3H is at the bottom. All the other boards perform equally in this test. So to conclude for the i3 tests then, with a maximum power need of just 50 watts, it's no surprise that all of these boards are capable of running it to its full potential. However, there are a couple of points of interest here. Firstly, that the Gigabyte DS3H consistently came at the bottom of the performance charts across all of the tests, and also that the ASRock RS needed just a little tweak to its power profile, a lift in that power limit, to make it perform equivalently to the other boards. Nonetheless, it's nice that there are some good value boards that will run this fantastic little CPU to full potential, and that you can buy cheaper boards and not suffer any consequences in terms of performance. Now let's step up to the i5-12600. Note that this is the non-K variant of the CPU, and whilst it has a slightly higher clock speed than the i5-12400 for example, it does still adhere to the same Intel specifications for power. It should be allowed 117 watts for a short-term boost period, and then it steps down to a 65 watt long-term power draw. You can take this CPU as representative then of the entire i5 non-K range. And this is where we do start to see some substantial differences in performance, and that's for a variety of reasons. First up, it's Cinebench R23 again. This is the first time we can see some significant differences in results, and do please note there are a couple of reruns here for the ASRock and Gigabyte boards with different settings. The total score here is about 13,600 points on most boards, indicating that that's the potential of this CPU when not restricted by power limits. On initial runs, the ASRock scored low at 11,1200 points, and we had to use the BIOS power limit settings by altering the base frequency boost in the OC tweaker section of the BIOS. This actually lifts the available power to a nominal 140 watts, and you can see that with that setting applied we gain 500 points but it's still underperforming. More on that later. The Gigabyte, however, initially gave horrific performance in this test, prompting further investigation. That score of 5746 is lower than the i3, and indicates that something must be badly wrong. Luckily one of the first things we tried was applying a BIOS update, and Gigabyte's BIOS page notes fixes for non-K CPU performance issues in the F5 BIOS notes. Applying this update, but otherwise leaving power settings alone, saw performance improve drastically, but it's still a thousand points behind the other motherboards except the ASRock Pro RS. If we go into BIOS and manually set power limits to exceed the 100 watts this CPU needs to perform optimally, we see it match the other motherboards. Note also the MSI Pro, 
by default it applied the 65 watt long term power limit, causing a score of 12,283. Lifting this by changing the cooler settings in BIOS saw it achieve full performance. This was actually a bit of user error on our part. It's very easy when that splash screen first displays to click straight through it, especially if your screen isn't powered on yet. And then before you find yourself in BIOS as normal without realising you've actually set the power limits on the motherboard. That's what happened to us, and we had to go back in and change it to achieve the higher power limit. MSI tie their power limit to a setting with what kind of cooler you have applied to the CPU. That does make sense because the two are linked, but it's just slightly uh, obscures the fact that that's how you change the power limits on this board. If we take a look at the graphs of power draw and clock speed throughout these test runs, we can explain some of the results, mostly. First up, let's look at the simple effect of applying the Intel specified power limits on this CPU versus allowing the board to ignore them, looking at the MSI Pro B660A. This is pretty simple. If you allow the CPU to draw full power for the duration of the test, it keeps its clocks high and scores higher than the test. In the blue run, the stock 65 watt power limit is enforced after 28 seconds and the clock speeds drop accordingly. This is normal behaviour, but if you intend on doing long term all core work, like video rendering, you'll want to ensure that your motherboard and cooler allow for this power draw and that your settings are correct and achieve sustained performance. Next, let's take a look at one of the more complicated results. The ASRock Pro RS has some slightly more complicated issues to deal with. Initially, at default settings, it limits the CPU to 85 watts, and then 65 watts after about 35 seconds. When we manually adjust power limits to 140 watts, it still limits the initial run to 85 watts, but then doesn't drop to 65 watts after the time limit expires. This explains the lower performance. The CPU is not allowed to draw peak power ever, and no amount of settings changes or guidance from ASRock could change this. And finally, we need to work out what's up with the Gigabyte DS3H. This one is properly weird and not fully explained by the graph here, but the results do help explain some of the results we'll see elsewhere. First of all, on the BIOS it came with, the board is just straight up broken. Whilst it records a high and correct all-core boost clock of 4.4 GHz throughout the test, it limits power to 65 watts the whole time. But there has to be something else wrong too, because the test takes well over 2 minutes to complete when it should be done in around 60 seconds. This is that terrible score of 5,700 points when the CPU is capable of over 13,000 points. Updating the BIOS and again running default specifications shows that it now limits the CPU to 81 watts initially and 65 watts for the rest of the time. But check out the boost clock, it's now only allowing the CPU to hit 4.1 GHz all core when the CPU should be doing 4.4 GHz and is capable of this on every other board. It's only when we lift power limits ourselves in BIOS that the board allows the CPU to perform fully. This graph shows how the Gigabyte motherboard is underperforming, but doesn't fully explain why. Anyway, I hope it's helped explain the dramatic difference in performance that power limits can have on this kind of workload. To clarify the effects, let's have a look at Blender. This rendering program uses all the cores available to it to render out a scene as quickly as possible, and the time taken in total is the result of the test. Lower scores are better here. These results just clarify how badly broken the Gigabyte DS3H was with the shipped BIOS, taking a huge amount longer than any other CPU. Oddly, despite our last results showing underperformance in Cinebench, it appears to do okay in this test with the new BIOS. The MSI again demonstrates the difference between Intel stock power limits and lifted power limits. The ASRock RS underperforms in these tests, and no amount of tweaking could bring it up to the standard of the other CPUs. Moving on to some more game-oriented benchmarks, first up it's Time Spy, and again this just shows how badly the Gigabyte was underperforming until fixed with a new BIOS. When fixed, it's still 300 points down, but within the ballpark of the other motherboards, which all perform equivalently. The ASRock is also 1000 points down, even with adjusted power limits, because it's still being restricted to 85 watt draw. I couldn't get it to perform better than this. The other motherboard all perform equivalently, with around 10,600 points. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows consistent performance from most of the boards at 195 frames per second average. The Gigabyte and ASRock boards both underperform until we tweak them and adjust power settings. The Gigabyte, however, still shows slightly reduced performance, but nothing major around 10 frames per second average. Rainbow Six Siege shows the same trend, with the ASRock matching the other boards when higher power limits are applied, and the Gigabyte still underperforming by a small but noticeable margin after the BIOS update. So to round up our i5 testing then, this CPU does start to expose some differences in the way these motherboards handle their power limits and the effect that can have on performance. We can't recommend the Gigabyte DS3H because of that really serious flaw with the launch BIOS, and then some strange quirks even with the new BIOS in terms of the way it applies power limits and some strange boost behaviour we've observed as well. It consistently performs below the other motherboards even with power limits lifted and a new BIOS. 
Likewise, the ASRock Pro RS we encountered some significant problems with, and it's fully limited with our CPU to 85 watts. We know we're not alone in experiencing some problems with this board as well, so we can't recommend it at this time unless there's a BIOS update that's verified to fix these issues. However, overall, it does look like there are good quality B660 motherboards that will run an i5 CPU to full potential without breaking the bank. Whichever motherboard you do get, what I'd advise is that you apply a BIOS update to it because it's clear there are fixes coming out in more recent BIOSes. Check your power limits in BIOS and make sure they're set at a sensible level that allows the CPU to fully perform for you. And also make sure you've got adequate CPU cooling because if you do have lifted power limits, the CPU could be drawing up to 100 watts continuously and you will need a decent CPU cooler to get rid of all that heat. Now let's bring out the big guns and try out the i7-12700K on these boards. Now to be clear, this isn't a CPU I'd expect anyone to sensibly pair with any of the boards under test here, but it is useful in order to find out their limits in terms of power. First up, Cinebench. And please note, I didn't run my whole test speed with the Gigabyte in broken mode on the i7 CPU, so we're looking at the default behaviour with the F5 BIOS update applied here. The ASRock Pro RS is the only noticeable underperformer in this test, a thousand points down behind the other boards. We've got more information about this in our earlier video, so please do check it out if you're interested. However, the Gigabyte does score 300 points lower, and I want to draw your attention to one quirk, which is the dip and then spike in power and clock speed that the Gigabyte experiences at the end of this short full load run. Obviously, this is a demanding CPU, which will draw around 200 watts under all core load. We shouldn't necessarily expect a cheap VRM on a low-end motherboard to deal with that. So, looking at a much longer-term workload of Blender, we can see which motherboards struggle. Most are fine, notably the Asus boards and the MSI Pro. However, the ASRock underperforms owing to a 120 watt power limit being applied while the other boards allow a 190 watt draw. The Gigabyte, however, exhibited some very strange behaviour and it's not simply a blanket power limit causing a longer render time. Most CPUs simply hold a 4.7 GHz all-core boost on the P-cores as they complete the workload. The Gigabyte DS3H can't or won't do that. It tries at first, delivering around 180 watts and allowing that peak core boost. However, it then goes into three distinct phases of power cycling. First fluctuating from 65 watts to 180 watts, then 60 watts to 180 watts at a longer frequency, and finally it settles on long bursts of 60 watts and 125 watt power limits, which restricts the CPU to 3.3 and 4.4 GHz for the final portion of the test. It's pretty ugly and clear that this board is at the bitter limits of what its power delivery system can do. We wouldn't recommend doing this either to the motherboard or to the i7 CPU. However, given the pricing and the expected market of the DS3H, we can understand why it's not performing properly with an i7K CPU. It's not a CPU that's really intended to ever be put on this motherboard. Moving on to some slightly more sensible tests, the boards perform roughly equally in 3D Mark, although we perhaps see ASUS performance enhancement works some magic to boost performance a couple of hundred points. The Gigabyte and ASRock boards assume the same position at the bottom of the table. This is a short-term test, so long-term power limits don't come into play, but the ASRock is still applying that blanket 120 watt limit to the CPU, whereas other boards do allow 190 watts. In gaming benchmarks, Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows performance of around 200 frames per second on all the boards, with the Gigabyte and ASRock falling 10 frames per second behind. Not a huge amount, but it is part of a consistent story of underperformance of these two boards. Rainbow Six Siege shows a very consistent performance with most of the boards with the exception of the MSI Tomahawk, which outperforms the rest, and the Asus Tough, which gains 30 frames per second. The rest of the motherboards perform equally at around 500 frames per second average. And again, this game isn't particularly CPU heavy, so we're not testing the motherboard's power delivery here, more that they allow the CPU to boost fully. So then, to round up our findings in the i7 testing, we've clearly found the limits of some of these motherboards. If you are buying an i7 CPU, it'll be to take advantage of those strong 8 cores plus the additional 4 E cores in complex and demanding workloads like video rendering or complex calculations. In these circumstances, you want to maximise the value of that CPU by running a motherboard that's capable of supplying high power levels for extended periods of time, and also a very high quality cooling solution that's able to cope with nearly 200 watts worth of heat over an extended period of time as well. We wouldn't expect or advise anyone to pick most of these motherboards to pair with an i7 CPU, even the non-K variant. They're clearly not designed to handle that kind of demand. Of the boards we've tested, the MSI B660M A Pro is the one we'd trust to get the most out of an i7, thanks to its robust power delivery, good heat sinking, and importantly, the clear option to raise power limits in BIOS. Pair it with a good cooler, and it's a great partner to an i7-12700 at a reduced cost.
If you are considering an i7 CPU to take advantage of that powerful 8 plus 4 core setup and use it for demanding workloads, that's when you really do need to pay a lot of attention to the specification of the VRM and power delivery of the motherboards you're considering, and perhaps spend a little bit more towards the top end of the B660 range in order to get a motherboard that will support the CPU you want. Okay, so let's run through these motherboards one by one. I'm tempted to do the YouTube ranking thing and rank them from worst to best. The Gigabyte DS3H proved to be the by far the trickiest board to work with. It offered initially very poor performance until we flashed it with an updated BIOS. Gigabyte note on their page that this F5 BIOS fixes non-K CPU performance issues, and it did for the most part. However, it also showed some slightly strange power limit handling, some strange boost clock behaviour in that Cinebench test with the i5 CPU, and it consistently underperformed, although not by a huge amount once fixed. It is absolutely unsuitable for demanding work with an i7 CPU, but that's not the market it's aimed at. At this point, we can only advise pairing this motherboard with an i3 CPU. If you do buy or own this motherboard, you need to apply that F5 BIOS to it to get adequate performance out of it. And you also need to dig into your BIOS and check that the power limits are set to levels that will allow your CPU to perform somewhat optimally. It actually angers me that a lot of people will have put an i5 CPU on this motherboard, be running with that shipped broken BIOS, and never be aware of how much performance they're missing out on. Please do always run a benchmark check on your newly built system to make sure that things are performing optimally. The ASRock B660M Pro IRS doesn't underperform quite as markedly as the Gigabyte does, however there are still some significant problems with it. I do have to note though that that is specific to the i5-12600 CPU in my testing, but I have noted uh, other people on forums, on the internet and on Reddit, places like that, who are also indicating that they're not getting adequate performance out of this motherboard with an i5-12400 as well. It imposes a hard limit on power to 85 watts on the CPU, and nothing that I've done or that ASRock support have suggested has been able to fix it. I have seen some people report proper operation with an i5-12400, but also others who state they have problems. The way the BIOS update transformed the Gigabyte's performance leaves me with hope that the problems with this board can be rectified, since it's a BIOS imposed limit, and the board is capable of supplying more power to the i7 CPU in the tests we ran there. However, for now, ASRock have instructed me to return this board for a refund, and since I don't believe this is a one-off fault, it's very hard to recommend this board for anything other than an i3 CPU. If you do own or buy this board, update it to the BIOS 4.02 version, and keep a close eye out for future BIOS updates that I believe will rectify this problem. The Asus TUF B660M-E showed itself to be a capable motherboard with good performance throughout. The Asus performance enhancement setting is a bit of a double-edged sword though. Firstly, it enables itself practically by default in nearly all situations. If you're pairing this board with a stock Intel CPU cooler, you should disable it and apply stock Intel power limits to prevent overheating the CPU. We also question the wisdom of a board with this VRM specification trying to run an i7 CPU at 200 watts continuously. We'd only recommend this board for i3 and i5 CPUs, but it's a good performer and very easy to set up and get the maximum performance out of it. It's a great gaming and general use motherboard. The same can be said of the Asus Prime B660M-A, since it performs in much the same way as the TUF. Again, it gives full performance out of the box with the i3 and i5 CPUs, and you just need to make sure that your cooler is up to the task of dealing with the lifted power limits on those CPUs. If you're using the stock cooler, disable Asus Performance Enhancement to prevent overheating the CPU. And again, we'd caution against pairing this board with the i7 CPU, although there are higher tier Prime boards that might be okay, such as the Prime Plus. We haven't been able to verify those in testing though. If you do choose to run an i7 CPU on this motherboard, we'd suggest that it's sensible to enforce Intel's default power specifications and make sure that that long-term power limit is sustainable for the motherboard. And finally, the MSI Pro B660M-A has flown somewhat under the radar throughout these tests, but that's actually for the right reasons. It performed consistently and well in our testing. Having dealt with the power limit methods of other boards, we actually like MSI's relatively clear handling of them in BIOS. It ties it to the kind of cooler you have, and that's actually pretty sensible. Of all the motherboards in this test, this is the one we'd pick to run an i7 non-K CPU with lifted power limits to make the full use of its performance in demanding all core tasks. I hope you found this video a useful dig into the minefield that is Intel power limits. Unfortunately, we're seeing them much the same situation in this B660 generation as we did in the B560 generation, where it was actually very, very complicated and not at all obvious how motherboards were specifically applying power limits to these CPUs. All B660 motherboards are not created equal, and you do need to pay close attention to their specification and their setup to ensure you're getting the optimal performance out of these CPUs.
This is complicated by the way motherboard manufacturers advertise their power limits and enforce or allow you to adjust them in BIOS. You can see in this table the default power limits we encountered throughout this test. It changes depending on the CPU you fit and on the settings you apply. It also changes over time, with PL2 generally lasting 28 seconds and then cutting to the lower PL1 level. You may not even be aware of the limits your board is imposing on your CPU. To make things even worse, the ASRock artificially limits the CPU at levels below the specified power limits and below the level the CPU needs to perform optimally. I think from an end user perspective you need to be aware of two things. First is what the power limits are actually set to on your motherboard, and secondly how you can adjust them if you need to change them for performance or heat management reasons. In my opinion, MSI achieves this best with its setup screen. The ASUS approach is nice that it gets you a full performance right out of the box, but there is the potential risk of running your CPU outside of specification and also not taking into account less powerful coolers that may be fitted. This could lead to your CPU overheating. Gigabyte and ASRock have work to do both in terms of performance and in terms of making the power limits more user friendly to adjust since they're so critical to performance. Many users will be using these motherboards and not be aware of the very serious detriment to performance that the power limits could be imposing on them. Whatever motherboard you do choose to buy, firstly we'd advise that you do download and apply a BIOS update for it. It's clear that there are performance enhancements being included in updated BIOSes. Secondly, we'd ensure that when you install your system and get your PC up and running, you run some benchmark tests. You can use the demo version of 3DMark, which is on Steam, or Cinebench R23, which is also free to download and use. Running those tests will indicate to you whether your CPU is performing optimally or not. Also, do just ensure that you know what your power limits are set to and that they're correct for your system and your needs, and that they're letting your CPU perform to its potential. We really hope you found this video useful, perhaps it saved you some headaches or a bit of money. Please do like and subscribe, it helps our channel out massively and enables us to continue to do this kind of testing for you. We have got a full roundup of B660 motherboards in the pipeline using information we've gathered from doing these tests. So if that's something that interests you, please do click like and subscribe to our channel. Please do also check out premiumbuilds.com, we've got loads of advice and recommendations on there to help you get the most out of your PC.